they, they were able to um, have something in their own neighborhood that they could have pride in. So for me, that's, that's really the, you know, it's not about, it's no longer about the actual building. It, it's about how do we celebrate these special places that have meaning and they have memory and they have a past and a future and, you know, how can we be part of that future? You know, so that's, that's, that's the, my favorite part. Thank you, everybody. Today, uh, we have with us Aaron Hyland, and um, Aaron actually sits on the board of directors, is the, the current president of uh, the foundation, the Architectural Foundation in San Francisco. He was kind enough to, to sit down today and share his experience. Uh, Aaron, thank you so much. Well, thanks, Zach. It's uh, really good to be here, and thanks for doing this. This is kind of an exciting uh, uh journey that you're taking us all on <laughs> it's absolutely really cool. it's been it's been so much fun it is this is this has really been a blast to learn about everybody in in you know our our community here in the bay area so let's just if we just hop right in and can you tell us just a little bit about yourself and your background sure sure well um i am an architect um i've been doing this now 30 years I uh, grew up outside of Chicago in a working class neighborhood and uh, went to a, what I think was a very fortunate and good high school that led me down a path of getting into a really good university. And so I became a, an architect. It's been over 30 years ago now. Um, but I moved to California in 1992 and uh, didn't have any idea where architecture was going to take me. I just knew that I was going to be an architect and I came out here with computer skills, AutoCAD. It had just started and I got fortunate. I came out in 1992, which was a, um, a height of one of our recessions. So as I was dropping off my resumes to firms, they were saying, today's not a really good day. We're handing out pink slips. And uh, I was fortunate, I got two job offers and I landed with a firm that does historic preservation, Architectural Resources Group. They hired me because I was a computer guru and I knew how to put together construction documents. I didn't know that they were a preservation firm. I was looking for a firm that did a broad range of uh, projects and clients. And so it was interesting. I. Um, made a good place for myself there. And so I was there for 24 years and we'll get into some of the, some of the you know, pieces of the journey along the way and, and what's happened. But uh, I was there for quite a long time and uh, I shifted from being an architect and this happened in 2013. I went to Chicago to visit Placemaking Chicago. It's an organization that Project for Public Spaces is doing. And I went there to find an edu or to talk to them about an education program that I wanted to bring back to our foundation. And I was telling them this idea of, well, I'm an architect, but I don't feel like I'm an architect. And they said, well, you need to talk to Fred Kent. You know, I talked to the Placemaking Chicago woman about, um, you know, I really like building community and like how, you know, architects and our projects are really bringing community out and galvanizing them around something really important. So we need to talk to Fred Kent and Fred Kent is one of the, is he's the founder of Project for Public Spaces. And um, I went and met with him in Pittsburgh and the end of 2013 and I came back and says, I'm no longer an architect, I'm a placemaker. What's a placemaker? I don't know. I still don't know. Uh, <laughs> but uh, so I went down that journey and um, discovered that I'm a place keeper, I'm a place maker, I'm an architect, I'm a social anthropologist. I, I, you know, this whole notion of building something has always been intriguing to me. And uh, 
And so as I, you know, developed my career here, I decided to leave Architectural Resources Group after 24 years. I had no idea why. I mean, I knew why, but I didn't know where I was going to go. And uh, so I ventured out on my own and I've, uh, I'm now doing a practice which I call Architecture, Preservation and Place. That's the, the name of my practice. And uh, I'm a sole practitioner now. I work with firms, I work with clients, I work with individuals, and um, I'll take on preservation projects. I'll help firms figure out their strategic kind of direction and business development. And I'll even work with individuals and try to help them figure out how to, you know, make the best of their career. So it's kind of a good match with also with the foundation, right? So. Uh, Absolutely. You have, you, you have so much experience. So not only your, your 25 years with ARG, but you have experience as a, as a practice leader, an office practice leader and a managing principal. And then also as a sole proprietor, understanding all the different hats that right. have to get worn there and all the, the fun things that you get to do when you open a business. So the next question is, it's actually, I, I love this because, you know, from the foundation, one of the things I think our, our goal is, is to help our students figure out if uh, a career in design is for them, right? And kind of just show them all of the different opportunities that are out there, not just architecture, um, kind of the construction industry as a whole and, and get to participate and learn some of those things from a, a pretty early age. I love asking people, what was it that made you wanna become an architect? And was there a specific moment? And a lot of people can point back and say, I was seven years old or it was, I was in high school. And that's when I really started thinking seriously about that. That, that's a great question. And I think I have an interesting uh, answer to it. It's not unique, but it's certainly one that people uh, find fascinating. Um, I think I was four or five years old when I decided I want to be an architect. And there were two TV architects that I was aware of. Mr. Ed, I don't know if you know Mr. Ed, but the guy, the, the gentleman in Mr. Ed was an architect and he would draw on his drawing board in the, in the stable with the horse and the Brady Bunch. You know, Mr. Brady was an architect. And so my brother, my older, my, my next oldest brother and I would lay around on our living room floor and we would draw on graph paper. I was four or five years old and we would draw our favorite house or our dream house, right? And so from that point on, I said, I'm gonna be an architect. I had no idea what it meant. I didn't know what it took. I didn't have any clue on, I knew we built buildings, but I thought we actually drew buildings. That was probably more of what I thought. So um, that was before kindergarten or right at kindergarten. And all the way through, except for eighth grade, I've lived my entire life preparing, planning and becoming an architect. And there was a brief moment in eighth grade when, uh, and actually another brief moment in high school, but um, I thought, well, maybe I'll be an electrical engineer or maybe a social sociologist, because I really like to see how communities worked and people worked within communities and stuff. But I, I was too young. I didn't know what all that meant. And uh, so for a very brief moment, I thought maybe electrical engineering was, was better, but to tell you the truth, this is the honest truth. I chose instead of going into social sociology and social work, I chose to continue out down the path of architecture because I thought we made more money. <laughs> I love it. I don't think I was right. But... <laughs> so that being said, um... Can you talk a little bit about one of the favorite parts of your job or something that you get to do in your practice on a regular basis that, uh, that actually just, that you absolutely love that lights you up? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, so, you know, I spent my training and my internship and my early part of my career trying to figure out how to put a building together, right? And then I shifted to trying to figure out how to manage a firm and how to practice, right? 
But the thing that I really love and what made me think about actually leaving the firm that I'd spent 24 years with, I really love how um, communities come together when they realize that they have this incredibly special place, this, this culturally rich, legacy rich place in their community that they can coalesce around and have some pride with, you know? And um, we did a project with the Bayview Opera House here in the Bayview. And it was a pretty dilapidated building in, you know, pretty post-industrial kind of neighborhood that didn't have much vibrancy anymore. And they didn't have any money. And we, we got the, the building listed on the National Register and we're trying to figure out how can we do something with no money. And we said, let's paint it. Let's paint the building like the painted ladies. And so they spent $10,000 to paint the building. It was this kind of drab white before, just painted with one single color and it had been, you know, the paint has been, it was old. But um, all of a sudden they had this amazing community asset and people would walk by and say, wow, I never realized how beautiful this building is. And so it really coalesced the community and it brought in, um, you know, they, it, it brought pride. They, they, they were able to um, have something in their own neighborhood that they could have pride in. So for me, that's, that's really the, you know, it's not about, it's no longer about the actual building. It, it's about how do we celebrate these special places that have meaning and they have memory and they have a past and a future. And, you know, how can we be part of that future? You know, so that's, that's, that's the, my favorite part. I love it. I love it. There's a, it's, kind of the legacy that you get to leave, right? Being yeah. involved in something that hopefully lives on decades after, you know, we're gone, but. Yeah, and, and in addition to that, I actually like working with individuals and, and helping them on their journey. I liked how you framed some of your questions about this idea of a journey, because I do think our whole life is a journey. And how do we help each other on that journey? And so having an individual figuring out how they can have confidence and pride in their work, in their place. So you have the community, you have buildings, you have, for me it was historic buildings and historic sites, right? But how do you have pride in your community? How do you have confidence in yourself, right? And those together is what develops agency for communities. And struck under-resourced communities that are unhealthy. They're unhealthy because they they lack agency. The community members and the individuals don't understand that they can actually impact what's happening around themselves, you know, around the, their 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 neighborhood, their place. And so, for me, really seeing individuals, kids in our you know, high school with the foundation, you know, they blossom from when the first day they come in to when they leave 16 weeks later. This whole idea that they, that you can actually impact your community, your surrounding, your, you know, this agency, that's, that's the foundation of a healthy community. And, and so that's, that's really the two pieces, you know, this confidence in oneself and your pride in place and this ability to take that and realize that you actually matter and you can do something that's important. Um, so, yeah. I, that, that hits home with me, um, not even from a design standpoint, but just from purely, I mean, a philosophy on life, right? I think I first heard uh, Seth Godin, who's a, I think he's in marketing and he's an author, talk about that idea of agency and you know, when people are searching for happiness and meaning and, and a, a way to feel good about what they're doing, that's really what they're searching for is some level of agency 
to feel like they have an impact and, and they're able to make progress in their life. Right. And, um, that's a pretty deep, like, uh, that's a, that's a really important theme, first of all. And it's, it's I, I think, I think a lot of people are really searching for that. And design is, is a, just an amazing way to be able to express that, right? Design can solve so much. You know, you can, you can choose to design something that's inclusive or you can choose to design something that excludes, you know? So for an example, a simple here is actually one example, actually I have two examples, skateboarders. You know, when the skateboarders took over our, our sidewalks and our public spaces, right? Then they put all these stupid little kinks on the, the benches and on the edges of concrete walks and walls and stuff, right? And they were horrible. They looked terrible. And so then the skateboarders would still ride on them and then they'd break them off and then they'd have the, where the bolt holes used to be and it just really looked horrible, right? Or you could build a skate park nearby, right? And then you can incorporate as part of the design, the way the materials come together, a way that would discourage the skateboarders from riding on, on there, you know? Um, another simple kind of thing is murals, right? Graffiti and murals. You notice that people typically don't graffiti street art, mm -hmm. right? So this whole notion of designing so that you're doing it in a way that includes people and gives them kind of um, another aspect of healthy communities, kind of um, uh, an ownership of their, their place and, and, and then their self-governance -governan where they take care of it because they have pride in it, right? So. I love it. That's... Yeah. Those are those are really good ideas. Those are those are something I think that are not talked about enough when somebody is considering uh, a career in design, right? Um, if you wanted to kind of flip that, so now from from the, kind of the favorite parts, what has been maybe the hardest part of your journey so far, or one of the biggest challenges that you've overcome along the way? Well, there's been there's been so many, so many. Um, I think for me personally was actually staying the course, having the commitment to continue on, you know, even, even though I didn't have faith that I would be successful, you know, and, um, so much of what I do now, I used to think were three different buckets. I always thought that as an architect, I was a technician, I was building a building, right? As a, you know, I did a lot of social work voluntarily. I did volunteer social work and helped build community, right? And I never, it took me a while to realize that those two kind of go together. And I've always been committed to helping uh, the next generation become better leaders, better, you know, designers, whatnot, this bridging the academia into the profession. That's something. So those three pieces, I, up until, you know, about five or seven years ago, I thought were three separate pieces. I thought as an architect, I was a technician building buildings. And it took me a while to realize that building a building is just one vehicle of helping build community. And, and so um, in our foundation work, what I, what I tell both our donors, our supporters, and our students um, is that luck isn't something that just happens to you. So part, part of the, 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 the difficulty on this journey is that you don't know when you're tired how to get yourself into the eddy, right? You're, 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 you're cruising along, you're doing your grind, you're, you're happy maybe, you're, you're in flow, but 
when times get tough, you don't really know how to spin yourself out of the eddy or into the eddy, right? But once you figure that out and you can hang out in the eddy for a little while, and then you jump back into the current and it just takes you, right? And this notion of luck, you know, it's not something that just happens to you. So what I talk about when I talk about luck with our supporters and with our students is that luck is really the combination, the intersection of opportunity and hard work, right? So our supporters who allow us that, you know, donate their time and their money, allow us to give the opportunity and pay it forward to our students, but they've got to work hard. We all have to work hard. And so for me, the hardest part of the journey is just staying the course and and maybe taking a, a side road every once in a while and figuring out where that takes you. Um, and you know, it was it was a big decision for me to leave a very good firm that I had basically built my career around. You know, um, but I wanted to do more than just restore buildings, right. and that's what we were doing. It's not a it's it's not a bad thing. You know, I, I will always value that and I do that, but I chose to jump out of the eddy into another current because I wanted to do more. Right. And, and it's, it's, I, I feel like I'm one of the luckiest people in the world because I really enjoy almost everything that I do, but luck doesn't just happen to you. And if you don't have the opportunity, you're not going to have the luck. But if you don't work hard, you're not going to be able to take advantage of those opportunities. Right. hundred percent. What was a project that was maybe the most challenging or something that maybe you learned the most from, or just an experience that kind of stands out in your mind? If I can kind of pivot that question a little bit, sure. I was trying to think about what was the most rewarding okay. projects. Uh, the projects that, um, the ones that have been the most difficult have been the most rewarding, quite frankly, you know? And what made those projects difficult was the challenges of trying to bring together a story. And so I have two, and they're kind of related to what has been termed since then. We didn't have this term when we started these kind of projects, but uh, sites of consciousness. So if you think about the Holocaust Museum, that's a site of consciousness, you know, something that brings together a story that may not be the, the, the most, the, the one that you're gonna celebrate the most. So for me, Angel Island Immigration Station mm -hmm. was one of my projects. I actually worked on it with Doug Tom mm. and the Oregon State Hospital. Mm. Okay. So Oregon State Hospital was a mental, what they call a forensic mental institution. So the it's where one flew over the cuckoo's nest was filmed. Really? Yeah. And it was criminally insane people who were committed, right? So they were basically prisoners. Mm -hmm. And so this Oregon State Hospital was built in the late 1800s under this time of, you know, a new mode of mental health. And it was about bringing you out into the, into the farm, taking care of you, getting you connected to nature. And they built the actual facility around this whole concept. So a building that had a lot of daylight, a lot of connection to the outside, greenhouses, farm, you know, you can go out there and stuff. Then it shifted to experimenting on these people. And so I think the Oregon State Hospital is one of the first places that they actually did lobotomies. <laughs> seriously, seriously. Oof. And the, 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 the patients who lived here, you know, they were there for the rest of their lives. Some of them eventually, you know, were able to matriculate back into the community, but some of them had really horrid past and their families had abandoned them and they died there. And you know, some had died there and their family was still in the community. And so we found 
I don't know, it was a, several hundred remains of patients that had, you know, been, had died and they cremated them and uh, they had a crematorium, wow. they cremated them. And um, it was a part of the history that most people wanted to forget. They just wanted it to go away. And we were able to bring the community together and move the crematorium, which was a small historic building in the back, which we had to move some buildings to build this new hospital to right off the entrance. And it became a reflective memorial and mausoleum. Mm -hmm. And we created this kind of place that would celebrate if we could celebrate it, but that would house the remains. And, and so uh, now it became a point, a place of reflection. And similarly on Angel Island, the immigration station, it's called the Ellis Island of the West. Mm -hmm. Ellis Island was a place, you know, Statue of Liberty, you know, welcome our open arms, welcome to our country. Angel Island immigration station was built to enforce the, Stein, uh, the Chinese Exclusion Act. First, the first act in the US history where we actually excluded immigrants and they built the Angel Island Immigration Station to filter, to make it difficult for the Asian immigrants who came across, this is in the early late 1800s, early 1900s. And again, the descendants of the people and some still are alive today that came through the immigration station, they, that was a piece of their past that they wanted to forget. And bringing those communities together so that you could actually tell that story in a respectful way so that it isn't forgotten, but it's not something to be ashamed of. Hmm. So, um, I will tell you, I've lived in California, the Bay Area, my entire life, and I didn't know that Angel Island was used for that purpose. That's yeah. uh, wow, that's crazy. And then they closed it in the 1940s, and it became a processing center for the Japanese during the internment. Internment came soon. I think I did know that. But, yeah. So. Wow. Yeah. Anyway, so wow. two of two of my favorite projects, but as you know, actually your question was what's what's some of the most challenging ones, but that yeah. that, that, that qualifies for sure. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean to your point, it's it's those type of projects that that obviously like leave the biggest impact on you, right? I mean, here we are yeah. talking about them, you know, years later because that's something where you kind of got to change the way that something was viewed a little bit and using you know, using design and and you know, bringing the community together so so the final question for you here and this one i think since both of us are involved in the foundation um and you mentioned earlier just being able to see uh, the journey of a student through the program right and that's something i i haven't quite experienced that yet i just haven't been around long enough with the foundation mm -hmm. but it's it's a lot of fun just seeing how it brings the community together. But um, question is, what is the best advice that you could give to an up and coming design professional? And whether that is the advice that you wish somebody had given you along the way, or just something that you see out there that you, you would love to kind of shine a spotlight on, anything kind of in between there. It's kind of, yeah, this is a great question. And it's kind of what, everyone always tells us as kids and we never listen. And that is just pick your passion and chase it. Find something that really makes you tick and go for it. And it doesn't matter what that is because as you get down on your, as you get along on your journey with that, you're gonna be great at it and the money will come. So that, that's, that's the kind of the canned that's what everyone tells everybody, right? Mm -hmm. And the reality is, you know, God, what am I gonna be when I grow up? What, you know, I wanna do something that is meaningful, you know? So the real advice that I would give is 
just pick a path and keep moving towards it, right? Because sitting around wondering which way to go isn't gonna get you anywhere. Right. So just go for it, keep moving along your path, try it, oh, and complete it. So, you know, if you pick, if you wanna say, say you wanna be an architect or you wanna be, you know, electrical engineer, right? And you start your schooling, you know, complete it, get it done. You know, don't keep changing your mind every two, three years. And, you know, so get to a certain point where you've accomplished what you've sought out to accomplish. And if it's working for you, then keep moving. If it doesn't, then shift. Right. But pick your path and go for it. That is, I think, excellent advice. And if we go back to the mountain analogy, right, this is, this is the mountain and we're not quite sure how we're going to navigate the mountain. I think if I'm hearing you right, it, it's just let's just keep moving in the general direction of up, right? And we can go different directions and, and take detours here or there. But um, one of the worst things you can do is just stop and just stop and think about it, right? And thinking that somehow that's going to get you to where you want to be faster. Um, and I think you're, you know, just following your career, figuring out the way to go. I mean, you kind of do it as, as you go, right? You, you just, you get, you get that experience and you make decisions along the way and you make the best decisions you can with the information available. But, um, you know, and, oh. and one piece of advice that I've always uh, thought was fun is um, if you don't like the direction you're going and you feel like you're going backwards, turn around. Mm. Okay. <laughs> I had to think about that for a second. <laughs> that was good. That was good. Then you'll be moving forward. There you go. There you go. Awesome. Aaron, thank you so much for, for taking the no, time this, today. This, this has this, been amazing. This, this, this has been fun. And I would like to kind of end with kind of because your um, questions, the way that you phrased your questions ahead of this was all about our journey. Mm -hmm. And I just wanna share with you one of my mentors who has since passed, um, Jim Franklin. He was a really, uh, he was an architect, really good personal mentor of mine. And he wrote a book at one point in his career and he gave me a signed copy of it. And I may have it actually, maybe I have it right there. Um, but what he signed on it was, thank you, Aaron, for traveling this part of our journey together. Mm. You know, and, and, and so that's, you know, part of the, the, the same thing to your, your, your last question is, you know, life is a journey. We come together, we travel the journey together for some parts. We go off and do our other things and maybe we come back together, who knows. But uh, thanks for, for doing this, Zach. And I really am grateful to be, you know, traveling this part of our journey together. Absolutely. I, I owe you a debt of gratitude because you're the reason I'm involved with the foundation. So <laughs> I remember I remember sitting at coffee with you on the, the ferry building. What felt like that's right. It was probably only about a year and a half ago, but it feels like about five years ago at this this day and age. And uh, wow. Um, I I didn't know what I was getting myself into, but this is this has been amazing. This has been more than I could have imagined. So uh, likewise, I appreciate you bringing me along this journey. Thank you.